I invite you to be seated. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from the Father, the God of grace and mercy. From God, the one who came into this world to teach and to lead, who lived to demonstrate love and forgiveness, to die and to rise, to give us life. And from the one who fills us with the peace and comfort, the hope and the holiness, that we may live to love and serve as he did, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. What text we have today. They surprised and they struck you as they did me. Perhaps we should all be grateful that they only come around very infrequently. Let me explain that with a note on the revised common lectionary. The RCL is an agreed upon cycle of readings used by many in the Christian denomination. We all read the same lessons on the same day. We all hear preached the same word on the same day. The readings are spread over three years, each year focused on one of the synoptic gospels, the synoptic gospels being the story of Jesus from the beginning to the end. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, with readings from John filled in predominantly at Christmas and at Easter. Now, each of the readings is assigned to a particular liturgical Sunday, as in the first Sunday of Advent, the second Sunday of Christmas, the fifth Sunday in Lent, the sixth Sunday of Easter, and finally, the 12th, the 18th, the 22nd, the 26th Sunday of that long green season called Pentecost. The Epiphany season is a bit trickier, however. Sandwiched in between the designated dates of Christmas, December 25th, and Epiphany, January 6th, and the movable feast of Easter, which comes on the first Sunday following the first full moon after the vernal spring equinox on March 21st. Did you all get that? In other words, Easter can come as early as March 22nd or as late as March, April 25th. Now, considering all this, we rarely get to today, the seventh Sunday of Epiphany. And if we do, it is even more unlikely that it would fall in a Luke year to give us these particular texts. And just another note. I checked in every Lutheran hymnal going back since before any of us were born. This text was not even prescribed to be read in a Lutheran Sunday worship service until 1978. Any guess why? No. But here we are, faced with Jesus teaching against the wisdom of the ages. Love your enemies. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Brothers and sisters, it's the most radical teaching in all of the Gospels. Gil Bailey, a Roman Catholic, is founder and president of the Cornerstone Forum. This organization works to call attention to the unique cultural spiritual and anthropological significance of the Judeo-Christian religion for the world. It works to call attention to the historical, the history altering impact of Christ and his cross. It works to call attention to the growing challenges confronting the Christian vocation in our day. And reflecting on those verses that read, but I say to you that listen, 
Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do unto others as they would, as you would have them do to you. Gil Bailey writes, in other words, don't do to others as they do to you, but as you would have them do to you. Doing unto others as they do to you is the old world of reciprocity, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Jesus asked us to do as you would have them do. In other words, love your enemies. Why? Because underneath they are really good people after all? Not necessarily. No, we do so because as a child of God, we are called to love our enemies and be merciful as our Father is merciful. Of all of the hard things that Jesus asked us to do, this has to be the hardest. After all, it's easy, isn't it? To distrust, to dislike, to even hate someone who has hurt us or someone we know has done deceitful, evil things in our society. And so we might pray, Lord, how can I love such a person? If I love them, aren't they just getting away with it? Won't they just keep doing it over and over and hurting us more and more? Don't I have a right to seek revenge? Don't we have the need to find justice? Don't we have the freedom to hate just a little bit? But you all, but you see, God knows and hate hurts us even more. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, hatred is like an unchecked cancer. Hate corrodes the personality and eats away its vital unity. Hate destroys a person's sense of values and objectivity. And beyond what hate does to our own selves, how it makes us feel, I have to ask, I wonder how God feels when I make the same sinful mistakes, do the same evil actions over and over. But God does not hate. God loves. And we have seen what God does, haven't we? How God sends his sinless and innocent son into our world to show us, you and me, by his suffering and death, what it means to love our enemies and to be merciful, when even from the cross, Jesus cries, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Brother and sister, if you and I are to be, as Luther says, little Christ in our world today, and to keep our baptismal promise to serve others following the example of Jesus. We need to honestly come to terms with what these words mean and with what we are being called and asked to do. Now, in your bulletin, or handed to you by an usher, you have a piece of paper. I assume that in your pocket or your purse or in the pew rack ahead of you, there's a pencil to fill in the blanks. This helps me to understand what the words mean. Justice. Justice is getting what you deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy. Mercy is getting, is not getting what you deserve. 
Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And then we come up to this strange looking word here, transliterated from the Greek, because my computer doesn't have Greek on it. Oktrimon. I'm terrible at Greek. Let me try that again. Oktrimon, mon, oktrimon, whatever. <laughs> oh, my professor would be turning over in his grave if he could hear this. Oktrimon is translated as merciful, but it's better translated as compassionate. Compassionate meaning literally to feel with. Pastor Jim Somerville in his sermon this week on a sermon for every Sunday, bet you didn't know there was a site like that on the internet, did you? A sermon for every Sunday. Famous preachers from all over the country record a sermon that in small churches that don't have a pastor to preach, they can just play it on their TV or their live stream or whatever. Believe me, I did not copy this sermon from him, <laughs> although I was tempted. The word that is translated as merciful in the Revised Standard and the New International Versions is the Greek word oktirmon, better translated as compassionate. Actually, be compassionate, Jesus says, just as your father is compassionate. It's an important distinction. Mercy is what a superior might show to a subordinate who's done something wrong. I'll let you off this time, he says. But compassion means literally to feel with. It's a visceral sharing of someone else's pain so that you suffer right along with that one and find yourselves moved to do something about it. This, says Jesus, is what God does. He feels the pain of the wicked and the ungrateful. And when he feels their pain, when he shares in their sufferings, he's moved to do something about it. Love your enemies. Be compassionate, Jesus concludes, just as your father is compassionate. Perhaps compassion is the cross we hear Jesus calling us to bear if we would follow him. In 1881, the famous preacher Charles Spurgeon preached a sermon based on this text. He entitled it, The Heroic in Christianity, thinking specifically about the life of discipleship depicted in the gospel passage for today. Spurgeon describes Jesus as calling us to exhibit heroics, the heroic of lavishing kindness on others, the heroic of being extraordinarily gentle and peaceable and meek, the heroic of having our joy found in God, the heroic of fearlessness and a willingness to endure hard times, the heroic of true humility and delighting in serving others. The heroic of living with faith and servitude. This, according to Spurgeon, is what it means for us to be set apart in our baptism as God's people. It's what makes us different from the rest of the world. Don Porter, creator of the documentary called Good Trouble, writes about Representative John Lewis, one of the group of Southern black freedom fighters and a faithful Baptist Christian till the end of his life. She says, 
In the two years I spent documenting his life, I watched films in which a young Lewis walks again and again with almost preternatural calm into a firestorm of hate. His superpower was his determination to never give up. In more than 60 years of activism, Lewis never allowed anyone else to make him hate. He told me that once he realized he could live love, once he realized he could love his attackers, once he realized his love could outlast their anger, he lost all fear. All this, he told me, was ultimately how he found freedom. In losing fear of pain, suffering even death, he felt free, free to challenge unjust laws, free to challenge us all to be better people. Brothers and sisters, today Jesus calls to us as he did to that crowd on the plain in Israel. Love your enemies. Be compassionate as your Father is compassionate. Live in the kingdom of God that has come in Jesus, is present with us now, and will come in its fullness in God's good time. Our connection to Christ challenges us with the call and the conviction to want to be more like him. Our baptism bestows upon us the spirit and the strength to see it through. Love your enemies. It does not make us victims. It makes us victors through the cross of Christ to which we cling. Be compassionate as your Father is compassionate, gives us the understanding of others so that we may love them. Now, the only question that remains is how will this make a difference in your life, in my life, as we live out our baptismal promise day after day after day. May God who calls us to do it help us to accomplish it. Amen.